very much this morning. We're so grateful for your faithfulness, your mercy, and your love. Thank you for the first eight months of this year. Thank you for how far you have brought us. Thank you for even your faithfulness that we have begun to enjoy today already. As we look into your word this morning, we know that you will speak to us and we trust you for grace to obey you. We know that the blessings and benefits of the gospel will be seen in our lives. Let people who meet with us after now recognize that we have been with Jesus. Thank you, Holy Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I did something at the first service. Please turn to your neighbor and greet your neighbor. And uh, take some time to do it. Not the usual, just greet your neighbor. Hi. You know, you can even greet your neighbor. So I, take a minute or two. Okay? Take a minute or two. Yeah, take a minute or two. Talk to somebody. You know. Yeah, there was a time we couldn't talk to people who seated next to us. So talk to somebody now. Deliberately talk to the person. The same way Sweet Sam is deliberately sang a song we'll remember. Talk to somebody. Like his shirt or so long as not somebody else's husband. So talk, talk for a minute or two, you know. Yeah. And you might be sitting next to the right person and you use the opportunity to ask for the person's phone number or where they live, you know. Some people are smiling, some are frowning. <laughs> Please turn with me in your Bible to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs 30 from verse 24. There are four things which are little on the earth, but they are exceedingly wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their food in the summer. In the summer, excuse me. The rock badgers are a feeble folk, yet they make their homes in the cracks. The locusts have no king, yet they all advance in ranks. The spider or lizard skillfully grasps with his hands and is in king's palaces. The title of today's message is Timeless Survivor Tips. Timeless Survivor Tips. If something is timeless, it means it's not restricted to any date or time. Something everlasting, in a sense. Something that worked in 1204, that worked in 1902, that will work today and will still work tomorrow. The Bible says, forever, O oh God, your word is settled in heaven. So God's word is true and God's word always works. There are some things we say commonly today, and let's remind ourselves about one or two of them. We talk about survival of the fittest. In biology, I think we were taught in A-level biology class, maybe O-levels. I, I, can't, I, I think I, I remember that definitely in A-levels. We were taught about what is called natural selection. And natural selection is supposed to be that organisms or creatures that are best adapted to the environment, meaning they have some things with them, they are the ones that survive and reproduce. So they continue, in other words. The opposite of that is extinction of the weakest. So those that are not well adapted to the environment end up being extinct. They are animals and organisms that existed in the past. Science has evidence and they don't exist anymore because they were not well adapted to whatever changes came. So natural selection is supposed to be, you know, that. And that's what survival of the fittest means technically. But today, in grammatical usage, it means the strongest person will win. It means whoever has the most resources will come out tops in life. But you know, scriptures tell us, and I think we should read part of that, Ecclesiastes 9-11, the A part, the Bible reads, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise. You know, naturally, the race should be to the swift. I mean, can, can you beat, uh, what, what's his name again, the guy who's retired now? Uh, uh, Bolt, thank you. Can you beat Bolt? Uh -huh. ah, so the race is supposed to be to a sweep. So we can insert necessarily so that we make sense. The race is not necessarily to the swift, nor the battle necessarily to the strong. For instance, can you beat Mike Tyson? Of course, the battle is to the strong. But what that person is saying is, I've observed in life that things don't always fall on all floor, all fours. Things don't always work out the way you will expect. So the race is not always to the swift. The battle is not necessarily to the strong. So there are other factors, in other words, that can make something happen. In 1 Corinthians 11, 14, the Bible says, does not nature itself teach you that long hair is, so let's leave the long hair 
The important thing is nature teaches the gospel. So when we look at nature, there are things we can learn about God. I'm talking about survival of the fetus. So when we say grammatically now, we're not talking about natural selection of biology. We're just saying the stronger person will win in life. The person who is supposed to dominate will dominate and so on and so forth. And those who are weak will be left out in the cold. Let's talk about another thing that we say today. We talk about jungle justice. Technically, jungle justice is extrajudicial killing. You suspect this person is a witch, or you think this person wanted to steal a mobile phone, and before you say Jack Robinson, they put a tie around his neck, and a mob will gather, and you can't hold anybody for it, and they burn the person alive. Such things should not be happening in this day and time. Unfortunately, such things still happen in Nigeria, particularly Lagos. Jungle justice is what it is called. Now, it's borrowed from the jungle. In the jungle, there are no laws. In the jungle, nobody went to school, so nobody is expected to be decent. In the jungle, there's no policeman to arrest anybody. So what happens in the jungle is survival of the fittest, how we use it today. However, we just read in the Bible that there are some things that are small, and yet they are exceedingly wise, and they survive and become all that God wants them to be. Ants are who God wants them to be till tomorrow. And all of these lizards and all these things we're going to talk about in the next couple of weeks. We're starting today. We won't be able to conclude today. The point is this. Ants don't think. Lizards don't think. They are creatures of instinct. It's God that put the instincts in them to survive in a hostile environment. They live in the jungle. All kinds of things happen. They don't stand a chance because they are small inside. And yet, they become all that they are supposed to become because of instincts that God put in them. And if we can learn those things that are instinctive for them and we apply them in our lives today, it means no matter what society is like, we survive. If there are principles that are from God. Can you please shout hallelujah? We live in very evil times. And it's not just Nigeria, all over the world. But it's much worse in our own country. In this past week, UNICEF said there are now 20 million out-of-school children in Nigeria. 20 million. And what's going to happen to them tomorrow? So you can see why Boko Haram has recruits easily, because what's going to happen to those 20 million children? All kinds of information that we hear now. In the past week also, Nigeria is now second most attacked nation by terrorists. We're second from the year. The only country worse than Nigeria now is Iraq. Or Iraq, as Americans will say, they must pronounce I in everything. So they say semi-final. So Iraq is the only country worse. So we're even worse than Afghanistan, Syria, all those other countries. Can you imagine second position? Out of school children, those who died during childbirth. I mean, all kinds of parameters you can imagine. Nigeria is not an easy place to live. But thank God we're God's children. Can you shout hallelujah? I know some people are jackpying, but how many people have the opportunities to jackpot? How many people? Okay, you are the older people. The, those are first service, we understand jackpot straight away. It's not too long ago I started hearing jackpot, jackpot. Jackpot is to take off, you know. <laughs> it's a shame that in the early 80s, we had this thing on NTA, someone named Andrew, who was checking out. How many remember Andrew? Uh, it's your generation. The Andrew, you wore a three-piece suit. Say, man, so I'm checking out. No light, no water. No telephone, no good roast, no good. Man, you can't even get a bottle of salt drink. People are sitting here. They're checking out more now than then. How can 1984 even be better, or 1982 or whatever, be better than now? Why are we supposed, why are we regressing when the rest of the world is going forward? So if it's not important for any other person to know how to survive, it's important for anybody who lives in Nigeria to know how to survive. By divine principles. Not just to survive, to become all that God wants us to be. Can you please say amen? amen. However, we're not learning from who you will expect us to learn from. We're not learning politics from Winston Churchill of England or Abraham Lincoln of America or Chief Obafemi Awolowo of Nigeria. We're not learning about war from Adolf Hitler or Benito Mussolini or Black Scorpion. I know you know Black Scorpion. Those of first service didn't know Black Scorpion. But you know Black Scorpion, Benjamin Adekunle, you remember him, Nigerian Civil War. Yeah, it was so tough that it was known as the Black Scorpion. I'm just trying to talk about those in other places and those in Nigeria. 
We're not learning literature from William Shakespeare or Professor Wally Shoinka. We're not learning music from George Handel or Chief Sunday at the Yege. That's King Sonia at this real name. Sunday at the Yege. Are you what? 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 Are I thought that when I said I was SU, I thought it was SU. He was one saying it the most. I said, how did you know? <laughs> Don't mind me. So we're not learning from the kinds of people you will expect us to learn from. We're learning from ants. What God wired them for, what God put in them that makes them survive against all odds. If we learn those things and apply them, no matter the times we live in, because they are timeless truths, because they are divine principles, they will always work for us. Number one today, preparation. Proverbs 30, 25. We read it earlier. Let's take them one by one now. We're going to take only one point today because of time. The ants are a people not strong. See? Yet they prepare their food in the summer. So what makes ants to survive the jungle? Is preparation. To prepare like we know is to make ready before time, to plan in advance. I'm surprised some Christians don't know it's important to plan. They think everything is praying. They think everything is fasting. There's room for prayer and fasting. That's fine. But we're going to see in a while that we're supposed to sit down and plan. There are all kinds of things concerning preparation that I'm sure most, if not all of us, know. It is said that to fail to prepare is to prepare to fail. To fail to prepare is to prepare to fail. Another saying is, preparation time is never lost time. Now when people start something and they start running, if you take time to prepare, you're going to gain it back. Preparation time is never lost time. There's another saying that when preparation meets with opportunity, then there's success. So you just keep preparing. One day, opportunity will come and psh, you are gone. Whereas, if you are not prepared, when the opportunity comes, you are going to be full of regrets. So preparation is very, 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 very important. Now, the text talks about ants. Ants know their seasons of life. Now, they don't know it mentally. You know, they can't think. But God wired them that way. In this part of the world, we don't have four seasons, so we don't know what winter is like. Those who have lived in other climes know what winter is like. God made every season, so every season is good, but winter is tough. Winter is tough. Very tough. And uh, averagely, there are 33 months of those seasons. There are parts of the world that winter is like nine months. There are parts of the world that summer is like nine months, but averagely, it's like 33 months. So it's like the two extremes are the really with us. Summer, three months. Winter, three months. When, when it's getting colder, that is fall or autumn. And then when it's getting warmer, it's spring. Unless you are aware of it, the average person who lives and dies in Nigeria doesn't even know that they change their time. The whole country, you change your time. You know, everybody, we, now it's uh, 11 o'clock. The whole nation, there will be an announcement that by tomorrow morning, 11 o'clock will become 12 o'clock. See, things that other people deal with, you know, that we don't need to deal with here. You know, we have summer all the time. So it's called spring backwards, or spring forward, I beg your pardon, fall backwards. So in spring, they move their time one hour, and then in fall. Did I say the opposite? Anyway, you've got the idea. Spring forward, you fall backwards. I think that's what it is. Or is it spring backwards? Oh, no, it's spring forward now, fall backwards. Yeah. So one in March, now in October. Anyway, everybody will change their time. Because winter is tough. So the ant knows, doesn't know, you know what I mean. The ant is wet that way. Three months of winter, no food because I can't go out. I have to stay home and yet I have to survive. How do I do it? Preparation. So the Bible says the ant daily gathers food. Because there's a time coming 
when the ant will not be able to go out and it must still eat. So if anybody's going to survive, there must be preparation. Let me say it bluntly. Your future is your daily habits. Please let me tell your neighbor, your future is in your daily habits. Please tell somebody else, your future is in your preparation. I think that's very serious. So, what do you do daily that doesn't benefit you daily? It's called delayed gratification. So the ant understands delayed gratification. When you see an ant carrying a crumb of bread, you even wonder how it can carry something so big. And you can't follow it to find out where it came from or where it's going because it's too slow. But the ant keeps at it every day. It carries a crumb. You don't know where it's taking it to. And it will do it tomorrow. I mean, how much food can an ant eat? Look at the size of the food. So the work that is doing today is not for what it wants to eat today. Let me say it again. The work the ant is doing today is not for the food it's going to eat today. If you are working just to eat today, you are not being wise. That's what the Bible is saying. If everything you are doing now is just for now, just for today, you are not being wise. You should be doing much more that you are not going to benefit from now. As I've said many times over the years, if you are a doctor now, it's because you went to medical school. It's never because of now. If you are an engineer now, it's because you studied engineering. So what you are doing now is never for now. Because sometimes people are surprised. They see the way somebody is living, and they are wondering how come this is happening in his life. It's because of the past. If he doesn't do something now, the future is not going to be okay. So what are you doing now, sir? What are you doing now, ma'am, that has no bearing with now? Where you are expending effort? Where you are working very hard, and yet you are not enjoying, so it's like you are a fool. I can't be working and working, and then there's no result now. What are you doing it for? Proverbs chapter 6. See, talking about the ant. Proverbs 6. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Lazy man, go to the ant. Consider her ways and be wise. Meaning anybody who is lazy is not wise. And, you know, we're not talking about laziness. We're talking about preparation. Otherwise, we could read scriptures where the Bible says, say, a lazy person thinks he's smarter than seven people. Lazy people, they, they think they are smart when they are lazy. They give excuses and, and they say things that they are smarter than other people. A lazy person is not wise. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways, be wise. Which, listen, oh, having no captain, having no overseer, having no ruler, so let's use one word for all. Leader. No leader. Has no leader. Provides her supplies in the summer. Gathers her food in the harvest. The ant is always working. Without any leader. So it means it's expected of a leader to prepare people for the future. This is Christian leadership now. We're talking about uh, preparing for the future. Political leadership is supposed to do it also in our nation. They should prepare us for the future. You will notice the journey of the prosperity of Israel. The Bible will record that every man lived in his own house and every man lived under his own fig tree. You see, that's the height of prosperity that everybody can afford accommodation, everybody can live comfortably. That is what political leadership should guarantee in a nation for that kind of future for the entire populace. But if there are 20 million out of school children, we are preparing them to end up in the bush and become Boko Haram. We should not be surprised that Boko Haram happened. We should have been surprised if it didn't happen. Because society unfortunately created them. That's no excuse, but that's the honest truth. Being hardworking is wise. So what do you do daily? For instance, whether you like it or not, winters of life will come. In John 21, 18, hear what Jesus said to Peter. John 21, 18, most assuredly. So this is not uh, tabishu born, as you know, people say, you know, it's, it's certain, it's going to happen. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you guarded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will guard and carry you where you do not wish. So some things come with age. You have to depend on other people. You are not as strong as you were. You are not as able to make money as you used to make. You don't have the resources you had when you were a younger person. Since you and I know that time will come, if we have foresight like the ant, we should do something now that's going to guarantee that time. Everybody's quiet now. Your future is in your daily habits. 
your survival is in your daily habits or your preparation. I've heard people who say, I can't stay with something for long, as though it's a plus. They say, I can't stay with something for long. You know, I just start and move on and all that. Should I tell you what it is? In discipline, that's what it is. Now, I'm not saying somebody shouldn't change. If you realize you are making a mistake, if you need to change, make cost correction, go ahead and do it. But you never stay with anything. You think it's a gift to keep moving on. Even the world knows that a rolling stone gathers no moss. You don't stay long enough with something to develop roots in that thing to hold you firmly for the future. You don't stay any long enough to prosper. You have moved, you have moved. I can't imagine what it would be like for a wife to be married to that kind of husband. I can't imagine what it would be like to be under that kind of leader that everything keeps moving. You never know what's going to happen today. Not so not tomorrow. If you have sense, you will start making different plans because this person is going nowhere. Mm. Delayed gratification, discipline, daily habits, hard work, self-motivation. You say, you know, yeah, you see, that's the problem. Pastor, I don't have any leader. You know, the, the aunt has no leader. We just read. You say, hey, my father died before here. Yeah, the aunt doesn't even know his father. Self-motivation. And to work without supervision. So what will you do now? Because some people, unless you run after them, unless you say they should do something, they won't do it. Self-motivation. Staying with something without supervision, but with foresight and with focus. Why? Because there's winter time coming, and I can't wish it away. I can't pray it away. It's inevitable, but my preparation now is what to show my future or my wisdom in time to come. What are you doing like that now? And what did the Lord Jesus say about this? Luke 12, 47. If you have a red letter edition of the Bible, this is in red. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself and do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. Now, this is very important. We keep talking about God's will in church, and that's correct, and doing God's will. But hear what Jesus said now. Between knowing the will of God and doing the will of God, there is preparation. So somebody just knowing the will of God won't necessarily succeed unless he does the will of God. But you won't do the will of God well if you are not prepared. So between knowing the will of God and doing the will of God, there is preparation. Luke 14 from verse 28. Please note this carefully. Again, from the lips of Jesus. Luke in particular emphasized the humanity of Jesus. So as a human being, please take note of this. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost? I was saying, you know, we must sit down to plan. Jesus said it. He didn't say we sit down to pray. He didn't say we sit down to fast. Which of you? Which means he thought it's normal. It's everybody. Everybody should know that. Right? Which of you will do that? So it's expected. It's a norm. As far as the Lord is concerned. If you want to build a tower, you want to build a career, you want to build a marriage, you want to build a ministry, anything that you can call a building, you have to first sit down, the Bible says, and count the cost to see if you have enough to finish it. Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him. You know, your friends won't necessarily mock you. It's because it's jungle justice. That's what the world is like. Saying this man began to build and was not able to finish, Let's look at the next one. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. Many things to learn from here. Jesus was suggesting that with an army of 10,000, it's possible to defeat an army of 20,000 if there is planning. If there's good preparation. And you say, no, how can 10,000 be 20,000? That's impossible. But with good planning or with adequate preparation, it can be done. And uh, he went on to say that if you know you can't do it, while it's still a far distance away. So we are not supposed to live for now. We are supposed to live for a far distance away. So as to take steps. I told him a story in the First service, something I heard at the squash court many years ago. Adieto Tikunja Bado. That means a dead fowl can eat corn. You don't know what fowls eat because you were born in Via, isn't it? That's your hometown. Via is your hometown. Is anybody's hometown Via? 
Or if that's where your parents are from. Is anybody praying from here? But anybody who grew up in a normal setting and you have seen free range before, before you know they like corn, or that's their a la carte, corn a la carte. Wherever they see corn, they must eat. But now to now say a dead fowl, we eat corn. That's not possible. So when Jesus was telling that parable, it must have seemed like it's not possible. How can somebody with 10,000 beat somebody with 20,000? So I used to play squash near government house long ago. I don't play squash anymore. I play table tennis now. I won't tell you that the Kintaibo is our local champion. You know, you know, part of why I stopped playing squash was that I noticed that when people became older, they had issues with their joints. Okay, they come share. And I used to play together. That's true. In fact, I went to Potakot to preach one time. We, went, we still went to squash court in Potakot then. I mean, I don't play squash again. Oh, it's the tennis I play now. You should don't play again. I saw that old people after I wear their knees. You know why? It's a high impact exercise. You keep landing. You keep landing. So your joints, you know, after a while. It's table tennis I play now. I've seen videos of people playing table tennis at the age of 100. Mm -hmm. And then because of all that bending and standing also, you are stable, you know. Anyway, so I, I play table tennis now. But really, because I saw that I kept having to go out to play it, all the children have left home, so that I took my wife alone at home. So, you know, so, I, mean, I don't have to leave my neighborhood to play table tennis. But the point is this. I had an older gentleman. He used to be one of the best in the bathroom, from what I heard. As a matter of fact, he was the best in the city at a time. When he was younger, I heard it's only his younger brother who could beat him. And um, so he was playing with a much younger person that was old enough to be father to. This must be like 10 years ago or even more. At the squash, you know where Vimeline used to be. You know that the squash, there was a squash court there. So this younger person, I think they were playing best of three. You know, when you are playing best of three, if somebody has two zero, that's the end of the thing. Uh -huh. The younger person was very good. I mean, somebody who would beat me in my dream. Even in my dream, I couldn't beat him. He had won one game, and the second game was just one or two points more. So we thought it was over. And the older person said, he was saying, even a dead fowl can eat corn. Uh -uh. I never heard that saying until then. How can a dead cow eat corn? You know? So he started. And then after taking some points, he would say, and he would take some Because that guy was good too. And age was on his side. Everything was on his side. Long story short, he became one one. And then the older gentleman won. And by the time all of, the, all of us had stopped playing, all of us took a players, we had stopped playing to watch them. By the time he finished and he beat him, he didn't have to speak. Those of us who would all said, you got it. Something that seemed impossible. The question is, is do you think it's that day he beat him? No, that day was just an event. It's what he had been doing before. Repeatedly, continuously. He had practiced and he had done some things daily that when Robert met the road at the Entotujuku Ujabado. Your future is in your preparation. Your survival is in your daily habits. So Jesus said, somebody with 20,000 can defeat, somebody with 10,000, excuse me, can defeat somebody with 20,000. That seems impossible, but if there's adequate preparation or there's planning, it can be done. In Genesis 41, you probably remember the story of Joseph, Old Testament Joseph. He interpreted a dream to Pharaoh. Pharaoh at that time will be president of America today. Genesis 41 from verse 32. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man, set him over the land of Egypt, and let Pharaoh do this, and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land. You know, you can read the whole thing when you get home. Anybody who had a Christian upbringing or attended Sunday school or whatever will remember Joseph's story very well. Here we're seeing a principle that's consistent in the Bible by the matter of two or three witnesses every word shall be established. Pharaoh had a dream. One had to do with cows. The other one had to do with grains. Both of them meant the same thing. And Joseph was saying to Pharaoh, by God's wisdom to interpret dreams, that when something is repeated, it's established. So if something is established, it won't change. It's inevitable. It will happen. There are things the Bible tells us will happen at the end of time. Those are the things we are seeing now. So they are inevitable. We can't put them away. We can't stop them. They're going to happen. 
That's part of what is happening today. So a wise person will prepare. So he said, prepare. It's going to happen. There's plenty now. It's going to happen for seven years, he said. And then he said, there will be seven years of leanness. What you do now is what will make you survive at that time. So keep to 20%. Keep 20% of whatever happens now. So those people must have seemed foolish unless they understood it. See, the rest of the world had to come to Egypt to buy food. The rest of the world may have enjoyed plenty. But somebody who had divine wisdom knew what to do. Don't eat everything you are getting. Because lean times will come. Do some so every day they were walking. Walking that they didn't eat. They were walking that, why are you foolish? Why are you not buying cars? Why are you not doing this? Why are you not doing that? It's because they knew winter time will come like the ant. That they will not be able to have what they should have and it's what they have done now that will take care of that time if it's making sense please shout hallelujah if somebody gets a dream job today and the person gives you the testimony ah pastor or so and so person i got the job in so so and so, so please and then you tell him start preparing for retirement the person goes ah, what kind of sport sport are you are you a killjoy but that's about the wisest thing you can tell the person. Because you are going to live one day. And if you are wise, start doing something now. Preparation time is never lost. If you don't want your quality of life to drop, or you even want things to become better for you, start doing something now. Daniel chapter 1, verses 4 to 5. Young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, Look at his advantages, natural advantages, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision. That's what I want us to see. Daily provision, daily, daily, daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank. Three years of training. The idea is that after being trained for three years, the king will test them and see whether they were okay to stand before the king. Three whole years of training. Just to serve an earthly king. They had to do something daily. Esther also, in her time, they were looking for somebody to replace the queen. I don't want to bother to read that anymore because time is going. And uh, they gave them perfume, gave them things that was to go to daily for one year. And then one day they will stand for the king. But that meeting with the king was a defining moment. Whereas all others dropped out and they remained how they were, she became a queen. And when things were needed in future, based on her position, she was able to do it. When they said, what are you going to wear today? Everybody was choosing what they liked. Esther said, what the eunuch recommended was what she would wear. You see? So let's bring it home now. Daily quiet time. Your future is in your daily habits. Your future is in your daily habits. Your future is your preparation. Deuteronomy chapter 17. If you read from verse 14, you will see that it's talking about the king. When Israel will ask for a king, these are the things that you should consider before making the person a king. The king was to lead. The king was on top. The king exercised dominion. So if you and I must lead and rule and be all that God wants us to be, to be on top and not below, to be in front and not behind, we need those things. But let's read from verse 18, which is what matters now. Also it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write, he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priest the Levites. He shall be with him and he shall read it all the days of his life. All the days of his life. That he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. That his heart may not be lifted above his brethren and that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left hand, that he may prolong his days. That he may prolong, so it's in his hand. That he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. We know the story of Mary and Martha very well. Martha was busy with many things. And Mary sat at his feet. Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are combined with so many. The only one thing is needful. That's what Mary has. Nobody can take it from her. He was saying, even I can't take it from her. She has found what she needs. And she has stayed with it. And it's going to work for her. And we are seeing now that you won't work for your children. I don't know any church that emphasizes the quiet time like Vimeran does. Of course, I haven't been to too many churches. 
So maybe other people emphasize it too. But I know we do a lot. Long ago, I saw the place of the quiet time personally. And I took advantage of it in my life. I never doubted the fact that my marriage will work. Never doubted the fact that my children will do well. I said it. And I said people should wait, watch and see. Because there's no devil that can stop some things in your life. I never doubted those things. Do you have a daily quiet time? When somebody has to pursue you, do you have to feel any special giz giz before you study the Bible and pray? Does somebody have to come and say, you have not read the Bible for two days, oh my dear? Daddy, hey, my Bible. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, they didn't come, they didn't come to church today. Education is another example. Education. Somebody said education is costly. So they told him, try ignorance. Education is the fastest way out of poverty. Yeah, I know people will say, hey, even those who went to school are not getting a job, still go to school. Otherwise, you'll be a slave for life. You will serve for life. See that those who you are serving went to school. Why can't you see that? I hope those in Yoruba church are listening. I gave somebody a lift one day and uh, I asked how old her children are and what school they attend. And she told me, she said, why is your children be going to that kind of school? I said, that's what we can afford. I said, if you need to sell your shoes, please sell your shoes. If you need to stop buying Ashwabi for life. So I said, ensure that your children get into some particular kind of school. I said, that's your future. I told them at the spring service that when our children entered the secondary school that we believed they should enter, my wife did a party for herself. She celebrated it for herself. Because she sat with them daily to prepare for them all this and all that. And when they entered, she knew if, if at, at this stage, you should be fine. Then I took over and started driving them to school every day. And as we drove, I spoke. I talked to them about life. We said things on the way, you know, things that will benefit them later. We, you know, jokingly, just on a normal casual atmosphere. Today, I have rest. I don't have to, they can't tell me that uh, police caught my son or my daughter somewhere that I should come. I hope it's not a gift. I hope you know it's not a gift of the Holy Ghost. That a pastor's child is okay. Now, you think it's a gift? So you didn't go to school. You are suffering. Then your children are not going to school. You say, fair caution, you fair caution. Can't you see that those you are serving, their own children are not caution? Huh? Caution to gain skill to support yourself in school is fine. That's okay. But not that's what you want to do. He doesn't have the brain force. What's the meaning of that? Please say amen. amen. If I say amen, amen, it's never too late. God began with Abraham at the age of 75. It's not too late. He goes, I mean, I'm already old. You know, and, yeah, that means you don't want to live longer. You don't want your future to see be better. The day I die, people who look at my note, they will see, see things that I plan to do. Because if you retire from life, that's it. It's over. Education. So it doesn't have to be a formal school you can do a course. You can read books. Proverbs 19.20 Listen to counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. So it's an investment. This is like counsel now. Going to school or a formal thing is like instruction. Listen to counsel, receive instruction. Why? That you may be wise in your latter days. And we are talking about wisdom. That's the essence of what we are saying now. Things that are lead to creatures that are little, and yet they are exceedingly wise. And we're seeing the arm, look at the arm, very insignificant. But God wired it with wisdom. And it's just about preparation. That's all we're talking about today. We're going to pray in a few minutes. Let's talk about exercise. First Timothy 4 8. First Timothy 4 8. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Somebody gave us a Bible on our wedding day, a King James Bible. It's still on my table somewhere. We've changed the binding over and over. I underlined it so many times that it's, it's holy. We find it some places. You know, before, before tablets came, 
<laughs> Reverend Diagi, you remember Reverend Diagi? Some of you know Reverend Diagi. Reverend Diagi saw the Bible one day. Ah, he said, a lazy Christian will not see this Bible. The whole form on the line with blue, on the line with red, on the line with blue. Well, I was eating it because I knew my few choices I did. Anyway, so that Bible has a margin in body and size profits a little. It says, oh, for a little while. That makes sense. Because this was a comparison between physical exercise and godliness. That means godliness is like spiritual exercise. Things you do daily, like physical exercise. You know, physical exercise, you may say, you don't like so, so, and so, and so, but you know you, you need it. Whether you like it or not, you know you need it. And you know, with physical exercise, there are some people you are doing together. I just refer to the entire world now. There's some people you do it together. That's the same way spiritual exercise. Godliness. People that you go to church together, they encourage you, you encourage them. You keep at it daily. It's not about whether you like it, it's about that you need this thing. So for a little while, that means physical exercise will work for this world now. But spiritual exercise of godliness has a promise of life that now is or that which is to come. So it means whether I go to heaven or not, it's not when I die that I will find out. It's now. How I'm preparing for it now. How I'm living now. So we're seeing that physical exercise is also preparation for the life that now is. So if we are talking about this present life, we're talking about surviving in this life, we need exercise. But we're talking about the life to come as well. Because a wise person will not live for just now. The person also will live for the life. If you've lived old enough, then you know many people who have died. Loved ones who have died. The way you are younger, you don't think about death. You don't, a 19-year-old doesn't think about death. I remember in university when somebody would die. Ah, it was very shocking. Somebody you knew very well. When we were in part four, we call 500 levels now. One of the Yopi guys in school, you know, he was, he was apparently he was, he was in a campus cult, you know, and uh, his birthday, his 21st birthday or something, he was in front of a car at the university. He was in front of the car doing something in front, and Owarawara, that's what they call those long vehicles in, 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 in Edo State, those luxurious buses, just hit the vehicle from the back. His birthday. And he died. Deputy governors, all kinds of people came for the bed. I, I didn't know in some parts of the country, people who are old enough to be your parents will attend your bed. I go in my own part of the country, it doesn't happen. But apparently they were pirates together, you know. They, the point I'm trying to make is this. It was so shocking that our classmate died. You don't think of death when you are 20 or 21. For the time you are 30, 40, 50. Not just that you see people, people close to you. Parent. Sometimes spouse, unfortunately. Dear ones that, that you had ideas and discuss together. Don't you know you are going to die one day? Is it a cause that somebody says you will die? It's not that you will die. That's why the Bible says it's better to go to a place of mourning than to a place where it's just, but that's the end of all men. And the living will take it to her. A man in sight, a wise living. Because it's a wisdom book, we take it to her. So if I know I'm going to die one day, shouldn't I be thinking of heaven, how to get there? It's in my preparation now as well. Let's bow down our heads to pray. Your future is in your preparation. Whether it's marriage or ministry or career or health or even heaven. It's in your daily habits. So if we're to survive and to become all who have us be, we go on next Sunday by the grace of God. Heads bowed, eyes shut. If you got anything from God's word today, please thank him. Appreciate him for his word. Bless his name for speaking to us today and receive grace to be a doer and not a hearer alone. Please pray for yourself. Apologize if you need to. Lord, I'm sorry. I have not been paying attention to important things. I've been living for now. I have not been thinking about the future. I'm just thinking carnally, not knowing that principles are in your world I can learn from. Whatever you need to pray, please pray. God, help me. I have jeopardized my future. I have not been there for my family. The time I was supposed to spend to take care of my children's education, I was fully, fully all over the place. The time I was supposed to invest in my relationship with my wife, I was in Abuja today, could you tomorrow? I'm sorry, Lord. Go ahead and repent if you need to. And then say, this is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to start preparing now. My daily habits will show now that I have a better plan for the future. 
I must survive and become all God with me. How many people can jack How many people can leave the country? After a while, those doors will close. Most Nigerians are going to live in Nigeria for life. So let's take this seriously. And even if you go somewhere else, if you see don't prepare there, you will see fail. So success is not a native of America. And poverty is not a native of Nigeria. There are poor people everywhere, and there are wealthy people everywhere. Father, we thank you for your word to us today. Thank you for what your spirit has got our attention to. Thank you for our personal responsibilities in this matter. We can't wish some things away. We can't hang them on the neck of government. Yes, men have failed over and over, but our destiny is in our hands. If we will follow your ways, we will do well in life. Help us, Lord. Open our eyes to what we need to do today to prepare for a better future. And no devil can stop it. Your word says you will be willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. There's good in this land up till now, and there's good in every land where people are listening to your word today. And we're your children, and thank you because we'll eat the good of the land. Help us to be willing, and help us to be obedient. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to pray concerning the needs of people. If you have a need today, can you please stand up? My time is basically up. I have just a few minutes to pray. You have a need, please stand up. Bring it before the Lord quickly. Let's go ahead and tell God what you desire for him to do. Particularly, if you have made up your mind to obey what God has got across to you today. Lord, this is our need. Lord, this is the challenge. Lord, this is what I want. This is what I'm after. Lord, help me. Go ahead and pray. Somebody has a legal issue. You are roped into what you didn't know about. You are careless. You should have read it. You didn't read it. And that's how you are roped in. God will have mercy on you. It will turn out right for you. But be wise next time. That's what God's spirit is saying. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise his hand because it might apply to more than one person and I don't know who specifically it is for. It seems like all oh, what you worked for all your life now wants to just go like that. It won't go like that because God's mercy prevails in your life. Thank you, Lord. Father, we bring the needs of your children before you. Your word says your eyes are on the righteous, your ears are open to our prayers. Your children have spoken to you. Your word also says, as I have spoken in my ears, so will I do unto you. Thank you for hearing them. And thank you for granting their heart's desires. Even beyond their expectations. So it will be clear is God and not man. With gratitude we will receive. We thank you for marriages and careers and businesses and futures. That you have a mind for your children. Nothing will be able to tamper with those things. Your counsel alone prevails. We we'll receive it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you need healing for your body, Lay your hand on that part of your body as we pray. Thank you, Father, because you know what the problem is. And hands are laid on different parts of the body. We receive healing in the name of Jesus Christ. Aches, pains, infirmities live now in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus hung on the cross not just for our sins, but for our sicknesses as well. We command healing in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. Heads bowed, still eyes shut. Finally today, Pastor, I'm not right with God. I want to be. We talked about godliness along the line. Has promise of life that now is and that which is to come. Are you in right standing with God for an eternal destination with God in heaven? Everybody who you know, whoever died, everybody you knew, I beg your pardon, who died is somewhere. Nobody comes again. Don't deceive yourself. Nobody comes again. Now is the time to prepare. You want to give your life to Jesus? That means you want to be born again. If you raise your hand quickly, heads bowed, eyes shut, everyone pray my name. I will pray for you very quickly as I take my seat. Anybody today, you know you are not right with God, you want to be. Please lift your hand above your head so I'll see it from here and know you want to be prayed for and I will pray for you. Anybody?